Tony Wrestling Podium Performance, and today is part two in our mini series on overcoming and defeating shin splints, the causes. But before we do so, remember to hit that like button below and subscribe to the channel. So the first major cause of shin splints is a sudden increase in either training volume, frequency, intensity, or the ch a change in the training cycle. So we actually have to take a look at that last one first because it influences everything else. When we change the training cycle, a lot of times we're either gonna be increasing the frequency and volume with that, or the intensity in our running, the speed at which we are doing it, or we are actually gonna be increasing both at the same time while changing surfaces. So why is it that the surface is so important for shin splints and for lower leg injuries to begin with? One, the softer the surface is, the actual less impact is gonna be on the body. Just think if you're out walking on the sand of the beach or you're walking on wet grass, it feels soft, it feels nice. It doesn't feel like you're pounding. Whereas if you're running on concrete or asphalt, which a lot of runners do, or on a running track, like track athletes do, there's a, it's a lot harder. So there's a lot more return in energy coming back from that surface. This energy return is what allows people to run faster on these surfaces. So track athletes run so much faster on a track than they do on a dirt path because the track itself is returning energy from the rubber that, it's, that makes up the track as well as the concrete or asphalt that the track is laid on top of. Now, why is frequency and training volume gonna be so important together? Because anytime you increase the frequency, you increase the volume that you are running. When we increase the volume, that's a lot more stress and demand placed upon the body. And now, why is intensity important? The faster you run, the more force that's applied with each step. And when you apply more force with each step, that's a greater demand on the body. That's why we don't recommend for people to just get right up off their couch and go out and run a marathon because that demand on the body is gonna put them at a greater risk for injury. All right, so this leads us directly into our second major cause of shin splints, a lack of recovery or period of adaptation for the tissues to be able to handle the training demands placed upon them. One of the ways we can somewhat get around this is by incorporating intentional rest days or intentionally having days of less volume or frequency so that the tissues can still get a stimulus but not be having such a high demand placed upon them. If we don't have enough rest in between either training days or training runs within a session, if we're doing multiple runs in a session, we're placing stresses on the body that it can't necessarily handle. And it takes a period of adaptation to work up to handling those stresses. Another major place of concern is crash dieting and hypocaloric diets and inadequate protein intakes. This is even more common within female athletes, mainly because of male coaches, which is the dominant demographic in coaching, are men, putting undue focus on strictly the scale weight. Yes, the, your body weight is gonna influence how well you can run. Just think, throw a 20 pound weight vest on and run with it. Take the weight vest off, it's a lot easier to run without it. That's the same type of thing. Oh, if you just weigh less, it's easier. But a lot of times this hypocaloric diet and crash diet that a lot of female athletes end up putting themselves through because of their coach causes a double-edged sword effect here. They're harming themselves to try to get a performance but they're not actually gonna get that performance because they're focusing on the wrong things. They're not recovering. They're not getting enough protein. If you're not getting enough protein, your muscles and bodily functions cannot recover. That is the macronutrient for recovery and tissue regeneration. Without enough of that, you're not gonna recover optimally or at all. So one thing we should be focusing on there, especially for athletes or anybody wanting to be active, you wanna be getting one gram of dietary protein per pound of body weight, or 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. One of the other things to look at in terms of recovery is whenever an issue starts to pop up, getting it taken care of right away, whether that's getting proper and competent therapeutics for it, I'm talking proper massage therapy, athletic therapy, proper stretching, getting proper chiropractic work done. This is only gonna help enhance your ability to recover. 
these professionals, especially the really competent and excellent ones, are gonna make your body's ability to recover go to a whole other level. They're gonna put you in a situation for success. Now our third big reason why we end up with shin splints is the anatomy itself. A lot of people end up with a little bit of between their tibia and the fibula. They don't really have any give between the two. It's very tight in that region. All the little muscles and tendons down there are lacking range of motion. Now I'm not thinking, I'm not make, trying to make you think that your lower leg should be able to turn like your wrist does. That would not be right. But there should be a little bit of give down there still so that the body can still have that give and take within itself. And then if our tendons are a little too tight, especially our Achilles tendon and our tibialis anterior tendon, we're not able to get proper dorsiflexion in our ankle, so we're restricting ourselves. Anytime we have a restriction somewhere, it means that we're most likely running the risk for something going wrong down the road. If our ankles are tight, that means something isn't right. That's a quick way to look at it. Just think, if you're unable to get proper dorsiflexion and movement in the ankle, the knee, and tibia and fibula area, all that stress that's going through there has to go somewhere. And a lot of times it gets taken up by our muscles. That's why we feel tight. But that stress over time causes a chronic issue. So this leads us directly into our fourth major cause of shin splints, chronic inflammation. So a lot of times chronic inflammation is gonna be excess fluid in an area. In this case, it's gonna be excess fluid buildup in the anterior compartment of the lower leg, right where the anterior tibialis muscle is. All this extra fluid will push down onto the nerve, cause pain, and our body sends a signal then, which creates a run-on effect. If we're not getting this inflammation taken care of, we run the risk of a chronic issue, like shin splints. And now let's take a look at our fifth major cause for shin splints, a relatively weak tibialis anterior muscle. What do I mean by relatively weak? You're never going to get an anterior tibialis muscle that has a very strong or a very high magnitude of one repetition maximum. It's not going to be able to lift a lot of weight. The muscle is quite small to begin with, and its job is literally just to lift up your foot. But when I'm talking about relatively strong, I'm also talking strength endurance, and that's what's going to be a major determinant in the health of your tibialis anterior. If your calf is extremely powerful, your quad is extremely powerful, that's going to be putting a lot of extra stress onto the anterior tibialis if it can't handle those loads that are placed upon it by muscles that are projecting your body through space at greater distances and frequencies. So your calf, your quad, and your glute are going to make you run faster, but if your tibialis anterior can't lift up your foot fast enough, so the rate, the, the rate firing of it isn't going to be all that great and it can't do it enough times fast enough you're going to run into an injury risk that becomes the weak link weak links is where things break down so while yes maximal strength will play a role you can work on increasing the 1rm 3rm 5rm 10rm of the tibialis anterior muscle strength endurance in this area is going to be a little bit more important now there's special considerations to be made for kicking sports, soccer, football, rugby, American football. Whenever you're kicking an object, you get a slight hyper extension of the foot. So as you make contact with the ball, or if you're doing kickboxing, mixed martial arts, you make contact with your opponent's skull, the foot is actually gonna bend slightly further backwards. This causes excess, not necessarily flexibility that's natural, but a very short period of time where you get the muscle to overstretch and the tendon to overstretch and then rebound back. If you're not able to handle the stress of that, you're going to run the risk of an injury again because the tissues there end up being pulled apart a little too far. And if you're doing this frequently and not able to actually handle it and get the, the muscle fibers to come back together properly, that's when you end up with a chronic injury. That's why so many soccer players end up with shin splints. They're constantly in a toe point position when they're dribbling the ball, kicking the ball around, and then when they kick it hard, the foot gets, right, uh, gets wrenched right back, and then you add in that they're doing a lot of running, that's a lot of stress placed upon there, and they haven't learned how to run properly, and 
in a lot of cases, they're never actually strengthening up this area. Their calf, quad, glute are getting very strong from running and kicking, but the tibialis anterior gets neglected, which is why specific work is needed. So tibialis anterior raises, whether it's with a dumbbell between your feet, a cable attached, you're just focusing on doing some heel walks, all of these are gonna add up and help improve the health of the lower leg. And now we have to take a look at footwear. Old broken footwear is one of the big causes of shin splints. What I mean by this is take a look at your shoe. For example, my shoe here is a Nike Pegasus running shoe. So when you take a look at the sole of your shoe, it shouldn't have all kinds of wrinkles, creases, and breaks in it. If it does, we're literally talking about a shoe that is dead or broken down. That means it's no longer actually gonna support you properly when you're running and you're gonna be taking a lot of extra force through your foot, which then has to travel upstream from there. When we're also taking a look at footwear, there's this craze of minimalist shoes. If you're doing a lot of your running on hard tracks, asphalt and concrete, you should not be running in minimalist shoes because they offer zero protection between you and the surface you are on. Now, you're gonna hear proponents for these shoes say, oh, but it's healthier, it's more natural to run like this. Go ahead and try it. You run the risk of greater increase in calcaneous fractures, your heel. You run the risk of metatarsal and tarsal uh, fractures and in injuries because it's not natural to be running on concrete and asphalt. So we're running on something unnatural, but you wanna run much more naturally. The vast majority of people to begin with when they're running are a little bit overweight. So that's a lot of extra force coming back at you. And because these surfaces have no give whatsoever for the human body, that's a lot of extra force being returned into the human body. And this goes first through the foot, which is why a lot of issues end up happening there, and then through the lower leg. Shin splints happen because things start to add up upstream, all this extra volume and intensity as well as shock coming through there causes issues because we're gonna end up with an increase in the amount of inflammation as well from running on these surfaces. And then something I've noticed and others have also noticed is that those who have issues with plantar fasciitis seem to have an issue with an increased rate of shin splints as well. It's almost like everything's a little bit interconnected uh, within parts of our body. If you've got an issue with the knee, ankle or hip ends up having something go on. If there's something going on with your hamstring, well, there's something else. So in this case, when the plantar fascia is acting up and you have plantar fasciitis, whether it's just from some inflammation or there's actually a real bad long-term issue there, something else has to pick up the slack and that a lot of times ends up being the tibialis anterior because our calf can handle quite a bit as well as our Achilles tendon, they're workhorses of the body, but the tibialis anterior can't, so then we end up with inflammation, and we end up with that chain of events. Inflammation leads to fluid, fluid leads to pressure, pressure leads to shin splints. So these are our major causes of shin splints. As you can see, one can lead right into the other, and it's a knock-on effect, whereas sometimes we can take a look and nip the issue in the bud early on, or if an issue pops up later on, we just have to take a look at, okay, what's being done and how can we rectify the situation? Is it simple therapy? Is it a little bit of rest that we need? So in part three, I'm gonna be diving back into commonly misdiagnosed medical issues that are called shin splints, but aren't, and can be quite catastrophic. Remember to like and subscribe to this video, leave a comment below. Coach Tony, wrestling, putting performance, embrace your potential.